Tim Burns, please. Hey. Um, well, uh, it's uh, nice to be here in person. Usually I'm here by Skype. And uh, so I miss the introductions uh, when I'm just uh, calling in. But uh, it's nice to, to be with you today. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the paradox of embedded and open source. So uh, I've been at uh, Sony Mobile now for about a year. I've been at Sony, a, a Sony company, uh, for about 11 years. And uh, these are actually, uh, and um, th these slides are the exact same ones I gave at Embedded Linux Conference. Um, and uh, so I gave the keynote at Embedded Linux Conference, and it had been many years uh, since I gave uh, a keynote there. And uh, over that time of many years, I've been thinking uh, about a particular uh, problem space. Uh, um, and uh, this is a kind of a different type of keynote. A lot of times keynotes at uh, events uh, are by companies and they're trying to convince you to buy their product or they want to relay some message. I don't really have an action item for you. Um, and so this is a little bit different. I just want to, to do something. Uh, in the US, uh, well, I don't know how worldwide it was, but there was a movie called Inception. Uh, and uh, I hope hopefully you've seen it. If you haven't seen it, it's a very interesting movie. Um, it uh, consists of uh, an international team that implants ideas into their subjects' minds. And so the purpose of this keynote is really to just implant some ideas into your mind. Uh, uh, but I'm not going to try to invade your dreams. Actually, I asked Wade on if I could be right after lunch. So if you guys start to fall asleep, <laughs> that'll, that'll actually work better for my presentation. Uh, so I don't. The difference between me and Inception is I don't care if you realize I'm trying to do this. I'm telling you up front. I'm going to inject some ideas. I don't have any dream invading equipment with me, uh, so you'll have to fall asleep on your own. And uh, but uh, in terms of the agenda, the outline of what I want to talk about today. Uh, I want to talk about open source and network effects. That's kind of the key thing, and particularly how that relates to embedded. Uh, and I want to talk about the Internet of Things. And uh, hopefully, uh, if you have some experience uh, with embedded uh, Linux, you know a little bit about the Internet of Things. Um, and I want to talk about fragmentation and, and what that means in the Linux space. And I can see from my kind of uh, boring outline, but some of you are starting to fall asleep already, so this is exactly what I wanted. So I'm going to cover this type of material, and I'm going to start with open source. <clears throat> so we all kind of know what open source is if we've been working with Linux. Um, it's the definition of it is a software that can be freely used, <coughs> changed, and shared by anyone. Um, and the way that open source works is uh, at the bottom of it, or kind of the start of it, is there's a license. Uh, and, and in our case, in the kernel, uh, there's the GPL license. And that license uh, provides the legal framework that guarantees freedom for downstream users to obtain the source code. So anyone working on Linux, uh, if you get a product from some company, you can get the source code for that product. Uh, so Sony sells TVs and cameras and mobile phones uh, with Linux, and you can actually go to a website and download the source code for that. And uh, one of the reasons that source code is available is because of this legal framework. Now, GPL is not the only license uh, that's available for open source. There are other licenses uh, like uh, BSD or the Apache license or MIT, uh, and those licenses have different legal terms. So different, uh, most of the, for instance, Android user space is licensed under an Apache license. And different licenses uh, have different uh, legal rights and responsibilities. They give the end users different capabilities. And there's kind of a balance between uh, the, rights of the rights and obligations of the developer and the rights and obligations of the end user. Uh, but all of these licenses really have the core objective is to make the software available. Um, and how it works is that uh, developers are required by the license to publish their derivative software. Uh, but that's not enough. So Sony has a Linux download site where you can get the information 
you can get tar balls from the site. But the system only works when people do more than just publish. Instead of just publishing, uh, you, could, you actually should contribute your, your code. And that's a different operation. Uh, if all of the companies in the world, if all they did was, was push out tarballs, uh, then we wouldn't have uh, all of this activity that Greg talked about this morning uh, on the Linux kernel. What happens is when people uh, contribute their software back, it starts to create a community. Uh, and the community is when uh, lots of people get together and they can begin sharing their ideas and they can share their code and, um, and through that process, uh, you can build up something as big and as important as Linux. And one of the things that's really important about uh, this community is that it creates uh, what are known as network effects. Uh, and these network effects are not just about, uh, this is a, well, let me, let me expand on that a little bit. So I have a, a whole thing here. So network effects is an economic term, okay? So a lot of us are familiar with networks like uh, computer networks uh, where information is exchanged. Um, but there are other types of networks uh, where there's relationship between uh, entities. Uh, anything that has uh, relationships between entities can be classified as a network. And uh, network effects is an economic term for the effect where the value of something increases based on the network of participants or the users and developers that adopt it. So the classic example there is the phone network. So there are actually lots of different types of networks. And uh, the one that we always use as an example is the phone network. So the interesting thing about the phone network is that uh, once I have a phone, whenever someone else in the world uh, buys a phone or comes onto the network, that actually increases the value uh, even if it's someone I don't know, uh, that increases the value of the total network. And, and so even though I'm located in the US, if someone in Europe buys a phone or someone in Asia buys a phone, um, they may not, even if they don't call me directly, even if I don't have kind of a one-to-one -one relationship, the total value of the network is increased. Even if it's just a little tiny amount, uh, then, then each additional phone uh, becomes more valuable. Uh, there are things like emergency services or uh, stores uh, or all kinds of things uh, that become available to me uh, because of my phone and I don't have to have established a previous relationship to get the benefit of that. The really important key is that I'm there's not a single entity creating that value. The, the entity, the value is being created in a distributed fashion by any, everyone who participates. Um, and you can see the same type of effect with uh, operating systems. So if, uh, if you've been around a while, you'll remember uh, uh, on desktop operating systems, we had Windows and Macintosh and Linux who were competing very strongly in the desktop space. And uh, the network effect in, in desktop operating systems uh, has a lot to do with the number of apps. So, uh, in kind of in the 80s and 90s, Microsoft kind of won the desktop war because they were able to get more applications. And so, because they had more applications, more users wanted to use that operating system. And because there were more users on that operating system, uh, more developers wanted to write applications for that. Uh, and so, it becomes a uh, reinforcing cycle, uh, uh, and that's how uh, what happens is the playing field uh, of competition starts to tilt towards one vendor or another. We saw the exact same thing with Android and iOS. Uh, in the early days of Android and iOS, there was a lot of uh, journalism, a lot of press talking about the size of the application store. How many apps were in the App Store? That was like almost a monthly article on how big the App Stores were. And that's because intuitively, uh, people understood that how many applications you could get uh, kind of represented the amount of value for that platform. Uh, and uh, so, so what happens is when you get a certain uh, set of applications, 
those applications are creating value for the platform, even though Google and Apple are not writing those applications, uh, the value of their platform is being increased by third parties. Um, another area where we saw network effects uh, is in format wars. And you see this very strongly. Uh, in the uh, 70s and 80s, we saw the VHS versus Betamax uh, format war. And uh, in that, uh, in that one, uh, you can argue a lot about the technical qualities of either platform, but as soon as one of those platforms got a little bit bigger market share, it really tipped the scales, and then that one was able to take over the whole industry. Um, and the same thing with HD, DVD, and Blu-ray. Um, when, when that war was going on, this one I remember a lot better because it was uh, fairly recent. Um, uh, I remember thinking, oh, this is going to be a long, a long battle between the two groups. There were two different groups of companies uh, that each had invested in their technology. And uh, I thought, this will last a long time. But what happened was, and, and if you looked at the content producers, the movie studios, I think there were like six uh, movie studios producing for one platform and six producing for the other. And all it took was for one of the movie studios to switch. And then all of a sudden, uh, that platform kind of tipped the scales in that favor. And uh, Blu-ray ended up winning. And it turned out that it happened very quickly. I was very surprised. It happened in uh, just a matter of three or four weeks. And I thought it was a battle that was going to last years, uh, where Blu-ray became the dominant format. Um, and what you see uh, is network effects Network effects is uh, a term that describes uh, networks, in any type of network, where as you add users, you are add value to the network. But there's a special kind of network effect that is called a two-sided market. And there are, there's more than just two-sided markets. Uh, there's three or four-sided markets. But you see uh, an interesting effect where um, you have different uh, participants in the market, so in the phone network, every participant is roughly equal. They can, you can receive calls and you can make calls. But in some markets, it, for instance with application stores, uh, there are different roles that different people play in the market. So you have an end user uh, who will pay money for applications, and then you have an application developer who uh, also participates in the market. And the interesting thing about this I find really fascinating is that uh, even, this is new theory, new economic theory. Even in 2014, this year, we're still evolving our understanding of two-sided markets. We all kind of have an intuition. Everybody kind of intuitively understands things like the app store is important. Uh, but uh, there's actually hard economic theory about how participants in the market should be treated by the supplier, uh, for example, uh, most, most people, when they look at a market, they try to find out which side of the market in a two-sided market is cost-sensitive. Uh, and then they'll make something, they'll, they'll reduce the price on that side and increase the price on the other. Um, and so there's actually uh, real math involved, it's not just intuition, uh, for how you can extract the most value from these markets. Um, and network effects, I think we take it for granted, uh, network effects are everywhere. Uh, everything that you see companies doing uh, has to do with these network effects. Um, all these companies, Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, and Microsoft, understand uh, network effects. And they understand how third parties are creating the value. In the case of Facebook, right? <clears throat> so I tried to move to Google Plus uh, because I want, uh, well, for various reasons. I, there were some policies at Facebook I didn't like. But it's very difficult because my family's on Facebook. <laughs> and, so, and so that is a network effect, right? The more my family is on Facebook, the harder it is for me to leave. And so uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, is winning because my family likes Facebook, <laughs> even though I don't. <laughs> and uh, the same thing with Google. There's a story about Google in the early years when uh, Google uh, got into the search business, they uh, were competing. Their biggest competitor was Yahoo. Uh, 
And what Yahoo did in the very early days, Yahoo was a hierarchy of uh, bookmarks. And Yahoo, the intent of Yahoo was to bookmark every web page and to make an easy system to access the internet uh, based on bookmarking those web pages. Well, Google understood very early that uh, every time a new site came online, that increased the amount of work for Yahoo. So it actually, and, and it made it so that Yahoo could not scale. Uh, and ya Google kind of recognized that uh, Yahoo's model was going to get harder and harder to support over time. And people would eventually migrate to a pure search engine where you just typed in keywords and then mapped those to the sites. And so it's really interesting. This is an interesting case where if you brought a website online during the 90s, you were helping Google. Okay? And that's still true today. Every time someone brings a new website online, it helps Google. Uh, Google has figured out how to put, I guess, what we call a toll booth, uh, which is a way to extract money from the difficulty of, of finding information on the web. So it's actually in Google's interest to make it, well, not, they don't themselves make it, but it's in Google's interest, the more and more information that's out on the internet, the, the more value that they have as a way to give you access to that information, as the gateway to that. Um, and so really the idea is the same idea as the other categories. It's that third parties, people completely unrelated to Google, are creating value, they're adding value. Now each individual website doesn't add much value, but there are now millions of websites and each one of those adds value to Google. Um, the other thing that you see is very commonly from, net, from uh, network effects is this first mover advantage. The first person into a space uh, gets a lot of, uh, they can capture the market. And you see that with Facebook. It's very, very difficult for a new uh, social media site to come online to compete with that existing Facebook because the, the current users are captured. And so you'll see companies spending lots and lots of money to get first mover advantage. Advantage. Companies will spend billions of dollars, for example, in a format war. Um, we saw this. Uh, Sony spent a lot of money, uh, and and they put their console business at risk uh, because they wanted to get first mover advantage in the format war with Blu-ray and HD DVD. So what happened was because. Sony wanted to include Blu-ray capability in their PlayStation 3. They made the PlayStation a year late to market, or a year later than Xbox, and they made it uh, more expensive by over $100. Uh, and that was mostly due to the support for Blu-ray. Uh, but what happened, and, and that was a, a very risky thing for Sony to do, but Sony knew that if, if, that, if that could tip the scales in favor of Blu-ray, that that would have long-term benefit for the company. And what happened was, even though it was very difficult in the beginning with PlayStation 3, once Blu-ray became the dominant standard, that actually became a benefit for that console. And so uh, it was difficult at first, but network effects ended up pulling the console. Instead of being uh, uh, a bad thing or a difficult thing for the console, it ended up pulling that console into the market. Um, and Sony did very well on the PlayStation 3 over the total life of the product. Um, basically, network effects applies to anyone who publishes a platform where other developers or users can create value. So you can see network effects in game development. Uh, you can see it in. You can even see it in things like uh, bars. Okay, uh, bars have uh, a role of matching people up. Uh, and uh, it, if you want to understand why bars have a ladies free night, I don't know if that's common around here, but then you understand that there's a two-sided market in a bar and the ladies are the more cost sensitive. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's, so anything that creates a, a platform where multiple parties participate and in particular where there's differences uh, between the two parties uh, is, can, you can apply network effects to. Um, 
the, the other thing that I think is really great about network effects is uh, they have explanatory power. They help explain lots of phenomena that we see. There's a lot of things that we kind of see and we kind of understand why they're happening, but when you put it in the context of network effects, then, then you can explain uh, why something happens. So we see format wars, why, why companies are willing to spend so much money, and why one format really becomes a dominant one because of network effects. But he also explains why there are subsidies. So it explains why the advertising model in television, why uh, TV, over-the-air TV, is free to subscribers. because And there's a network effect there, the number of viewers uh, versus the number of advertisers. And it also explains things like um, when you see uh, Adobe, for instance, when they produce tools that have to do with uh, Adobe Acrobat and PDF, Originally, Adobe charged for both the viewer and the editing tools, and they did not make very much money. And they realized that in order to increase the market uh, to create network effects for their authoring tools, they needed to, on the cost-sensitive side, they needed to provide uh, a free viewer. And so that's why we have a free uh, Acrobat viewer that's available on all kinds of platforms. Uh, and so because of network effects. The other thing that it explains, uh, although it's hard to explain all the behaviors of fanboys, <laughs> but the other thing that it explains is fanboys. Uh, it turns out that convincing someone else to use your, the platform that you use is, is a rational behavior. It, that makes sense uh, that I want to convince you to use the same platform as me. Because every user on a particular platform ends up creating more network effects. Okay, so every time someone buys a Macintosh, it helps all the other Macintosh owners uh, because it creates a bigger market for application developers and some and, and things like that. So it's a rational behavior, even if you see lots of irrational arguments used. Uh, so. Open source and network effects. So let's talk about how network effects apply to open source. So what happens in open source is that other developers are writing software that you're going to use. So this is a classic case where a third party, someone besides you, is creating value that you can use. And the more developers there are, uh, the more value. So uh, that's why Greg goes around and gives his talk. He wants to convince as many people to add value to Linux. Um, and it creates uh, what's known as an ecosystem, where there are lots of participants and uh, there are lots of related services. So there are things like books and training and tools, jobs, and even conferences and jamborees, uh, where people get together and all of that uh, increases the amount of uh, network effect, the amount of value in the system. Another aspect of network effect um, that kind of complicates things is that is the, the idea of community size. Not every community, well, not the, the Linux community is not just one community. Uh, there's actually lots of sub-communities. So um, uh, Greg was talking about this, like there's a, a set of developers that work on USB. There's a set of developers that work on ARM platforms. Um, and there's a set of developers that work on the drivers for NFC chips. Um, so there's lots, actually, it's not just a single community, there's lots of sub-communities. And the communities are different sizes. So while there may be 3,000 developers working on the whole Linux kernel, I found that there's probably only about five guys working on NFC drivers. And so uh, some of these communities are very, very small. And you can actually have a very, very big impact in a community uh, if, if, you, uh, if you're in one of these small communities. Also, people, individuals, are not in a single community. Uh, anyone working in open source actually will work in probably multiple communities. I've done stuff where I've worked on tracing, and, and then the next day I'll work on boot up time. And so we actually are working with different groups of people and it's helpful to understand what group you're working in and what are the network effects for that particular group. Um, and one of the things about uh, contributing to open source is there is a cost to contribute. Uh, in order to build this community, 
we can't just have specialized software. Okay, we have to have generalized software. And this generalized software costs more to develop. Okay, and the, the interesting thing, the rule of thumb is that it costs about uh, at least three times and probably up to about ten times as much development cost to write a general, pur general purpose piece of software as opposed to a special pur purpose piece of software. But it's even worse than that, just the upfront cost. It turns out that generalized software is also slower and it's bigger. Uh, and so that's part of the paradox is that uh, when we're working with the Linux community, we have to take software that is very special for a particular task and we have to make sure that it addresses the needs of other people. In the process, that software will actually get worse for our need. And so we actually, in order to participate in this greater community, we sacrifice some of the benefits of our own software. Um, so let me talk about embedded. Uh, embedded devices uh, really consist of devices with dedicated functions. And we're all familiar with the different types of embedded devices. There are routers, uh, TVs, digital cameras, set-top boxes, and uh, robots. Um, and uh, I just started working for a mobile phone company. I'm sorry, but mobile phones are not embedded. Uh, so I actually don't work on embedded software anymore. Uh, but, uh, and the reason that mobile phones are not embedded, the reason I say that is because uh, mobile phones are not special purpose anymore. Mobile, the mobile phones we have today, they used to be. Mobile phones used to be special purpose. They could do essentially one or two things. The very first mobile phones you could call, and that was about it. But over the years, mobile phones have now become a platform, and you can install apps, and you can pretty much do, they're, they're a replacement for the desktops that we used to have. And so, but with other embedded devices, you see this tension between the generalization required and the specialization. Uh, and let me, let me talk a little bit about that. Over the years, uh, in our embedded products, uh, uh, at Sony, we used to use a lot of uh, iTron, micro iTron, uh, for our devices. And it was a very custom, well, it was a special purpose OS. Even that was, was uh, more general purpose. Some of the early OSs that embedded were completely in-house proprietary. Over time, we've been converting over to use more general purpose OSs. The reason that we can afford to do that is because in, we have now general purpose hardware. In the early days of embedded, we had very, very custom hardware. And there are some sectors of embedded that still have very, very custom hardware. But now we're starting to use off-the-shelf processors that have lots of capabilities. Uh, and modern SOCs, if you look at the, uh, the processor that's in this Xperia phone, this is a quad-core uh, phone running at uh, multiple gigahertz uh, with uh, multiple gig of RAM, okay? This is, that's also why it's not embedded. <laughs> and it can run just about any app. It can run millions of apps. Um, and, but the processors are enormously complicated. Uh, and the SOC vendors, they're selling, they're trying to sell the, the chip that goes in here, they're trying to sell it to multiple companies and for multiple different uses, for tablets, for phones, for TV sets and set tops. And so uh, we're seeing very complicated chips being used even for embedded products. It's now the case that uh, even the cheapest memory that you can buy is 32 meg. Um, and I, I heard a case just a little while ago uh, about a semiconductor product that you could buy. And on the pricing sheet, uh, you could either get it with three cores or with nine cores, and it was the same price. <laughs> and, uh, and so what that means is the silicon is almost to the point where the price of an individual, um, price of an individual uh, uh, transistor is almost zero. It's so cheap that we just throw them away. Uh, and so we should get used to wasting silicon. We're going to waste a lot more silicon uh, before we're done because of this uh, general purpose hardware. But what I found uh, over the years as looking at this, I looked back at uh, what I had done at, at uh, Sony, and there was a, 
And what I, a lot of what I did consisted of something I call re-specialization. Um, and uh, what got me thought, thinking about this was a talk that was uh, in 2010 at ELC Europe. Uh, a guy by the name of Andrew Murray uh, gave this talk on, uh, it was about boot up time reduction. And he went through a, a list of the techniques that he used to reduce boot up time. And uh, it consisted of a lot of different uh, techniques and steps. Uh, but in looking at like each of his steps, he was actually taking something out of Linux. Uh, and and uh, when my own work at Sony, I, I did a lot of work with the Linux Tiny project, where we were trying to squeeze Linux down to fit in a digital camera. And so my job, uh, I used to joke with people, uh, my job was to take Linux out of the camera and uh, make it as small as possible. And so it's weird when you think about it that the community has spent many, many years trying to build up general purpose software, and then to use Linux in Embedded, uh, your goal is to get rid of that generalization, is to, is to reduce it back down and make it special purpose again in order to meet the requirements. Um, and before I go on, I'm going to take a little side tour on Device Tree. Uh, first, I should say, uh, this is not going to be yet another rant about Device Tree. Okay, maybe it's going to be a little bit of a rant about device tree. Uh, device tree is a, a controversial topic now in the kernel uh, because it's very, uh, it's very new and it's very difficult. And it has all kinds of problems, but uh, related to my talk, uh, the, the main problem I see, one of the big significant problems, is that it's very hard to specialize. So the what device tree does in the kernel is it allows you to take a single kernel image and uh, load it up with the software or the, the drivers and the features to allow it to be run on multiple processors. Um, and it does that by attaching an extra data table to the file uh, that describes the hardware. Well, what that means is that the kernel is deciding at runtime, not at compile time, what drivers to activate. And, uh, and the big problem is that because that's happening, one, all those extra drivers are in every single kernel image. So the kernel is much bigger. But it's worse than that because uh, not only are they present, you can't use any of the information about the system to do compile time optimization. You can't, you can't do things like constant propagation uh, or um, uh, dead code elimination. Um, and so the reason I got so upset about this was because I spent about a whole year at Sony looking at uh, link time optimization. And uh, last year, if you came to my talk at LinuxCon, you heard my long, sad story uh, about, <laughs> about how I could make very little progress uh, and it was going to get even worse uh, because of device tree. Um, but, and this is the part where I have to apologize to all this the device tree maintainers for the bad things I've said about them. Uh, device tree actually does have a positive aspect. And it does this because of network effects. So device tree helps build network effects. Uh, what it does is it encourages that generalization of the code. It encourages more of those drivers to be taken out of the architecture specific directories and put into the driver areas where they can be shared it's encouraged a lot of platform reuse. In particular, it exposes the IP blocks between, between silicon. So if you look at, even if you have two wildly different platforms, uh, if you look at the details, it turns out that the way the industry works, uh, oops, <coughs> now, let me go back one. It, if you look at the way the industry works, a lot of the silicon vendors are purchasing the IP blocks from the same vendors. And so the most common USB controller on the market is the chip idea USB controller. It's on probably at least half of the SOCs. And so this software that was not being shared between the, the architectures now can be shared. And so device tree has had a positive effect in terms of creating a network effects between developers. Um, so that's my apology to the device tree guys for saying nasty things about them. So, how does this relate to the Internet of Things, which is actually what this talk is about? Well, 
I think Internet of Things changes the whole equation. So all of that stuff that I just said to you, forget all of it. <laughs> okay? Because the Internet of Things, it's different. Uh, what we want with the Internet of Things is we want computers everywhere. We want computers in our cars. We already have them to some degree. We want them in our appliances. We want them in our furniture, our light switches. We want them in our clothing. Um, I have the Internet of Things. You may think it's not coming yet, but I actually have uh, 18 nodes uh, uh, on, that are completely on the Internet. I have a, uh, on my house, I have some solar panels, and they have some uh, transceivers on them that transmit up to the cloud my, the information about the amount of uh, solar power. And so even in my house, I'm already on the Internet of Things. Um, the other thing is interesting, we also want uh, Internet of Things possibly in our bodies and, and our food. We want it in infrastructure, monitoring our environment, water, energy, traffic. And the problem with this is that if we try to scale up the Internet of Things, if we want billions of processors in the world, we can't do it with these $50 processors. We really want to be able to run Linux on a processor that's only about 10 cents, um, 10 yen. <laughs> And uh, we want it to be able to run years on a single coin cell charge. Or we even maybe want it to harvest enough energy from its environment to run without any uh, battery at all. Um, and to do that changes the whole equation. Um, what I want, of course, is Linux on a cereal box. Uh, so someday uh, you'll be able to actually see Linux running on a cereal box. And uh, think about what it means. Okay, you can think of some applications for that. Of course, your kids would be amused if they could run a game, or you could look up Wikipedia on there. But what does it take for Linux to, to get there? Well, um, I did some research, and uh, most toys that are put into cereal boxes cost about $1, 100 yen. Uh, so if you can get Linux, the software should be free. But if you can get the processor and the display, and the power supply for 100 yen. Okay, so how close are we to that? You might think that that's very, very difficult, but we're actually very clo a lot closer than you think um, to having that happen. And in order to do that, though, we need to slim Linux down to be able to fit on processors that are at the very, very low end of the spectrum. Um, so Linux in IoT. Well, it kind of begs the question. It kind of raises the question. Do we actually want to run Linux there? Do, is, is that important to us? Uh, all of us are, well, I don't know. How many people here are actually working in IoT? Okay, so no one here cares. <laughs> so, so that's a, that's a, a little Hitachi uh, RFID chip that's that small. Do we really need Linux there? Um, the problem, and there's lots of problems doing this. The problem with Linux is that it is too big, it's too slow, it's power hungry, insecure. The original Linux system, 0.11 in 1991, ran at about 2 meg of memory. It turns out that it's uh, gotten a lot, lot bigger since then. Uh, but it's got a lot more features. Um, so is it possible to take Linux and streamline it, to, to, to make it small enough to run there? Well, I like to use... Uh, 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 analogy using Legos. So if you look at the Lego model of software, I have a friend who uh, got this neat model. This is a Lego crane. And uh, it's, it's got all these uh, super special parts. It's got um, uh, the crane actually lifts up and it's motorized and can extend the crane and you can control the wheels. And it's even got uh, this gearbox here where you can do different that you can control the gearing and everything. Well, this is a nice, complicated Lego product. It's about 2,500 pieces, I think. Um, if I wanted to, the great thing about Legos is you can reuse them. Well, look at these pieces. <coughs> these don't look like the normal Lego pieces, do they? They're all special, <laughs> they're, all, they're all customized. If I wanted to take, so this is like Linux. If I wanted to take this and make something smaller, make like, a little car, it's actually very difficult. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to start with a big, complicated Lego set if you, all you want to do is build a small car. And in fact, if you've ever tried to take apart these, these complicated sets, 
what happens is when you pull stuff apart, you have other parts that come with it, and it's really hard to, to get them all to come apart. And so you'll end up with uh, what I call a, a Franken car, a Frankenstein car, that uh, doesn't look at all like the car that you want to build. Uh, and that's the same thing with Linux. If I try to build a really, really tiny system with Linux, I end up pulling along a bunch of extra software, like the, wi the Wi-Fi stack. Let's say I want to use an Internet of Things device with Wi-Fi. Well, I'm going to pull in the ICMP stuff. I'm going to pull in the crypto library, uh, the O1 scheduler. I may have only one process, and I'm still going to be using a scheduler that's capable of scheduling a million processes. Um, and, and the list goes on and on. And so it turns out to be very, very difficult uh, to create a really, really low-end system from Linux. Um, and when I'm done, even if I did all that, I still wouldn't have the cheapest system possible. Uh, this Lego kit, if I was to go to the store and buy this Lego kit, it'd probably run me about uh, 2 or $3. Uh, but this plastic car, if someone goes to the extra effort to create an um, injection mold for the plastic, they can produce this for like 10 cents. Uh, and so there's a, if you go to the extra work up front on, say, a proprietary OS, you can, you can do it that's ex exactly what you want compared to this Frankenstein monster. So it kind of, uh, again, raises the question, well, okay, so let me talk about that. I've talked a little bit about how hard it is to pull stuff apart. Uh, and it's kind of the folly of subtractive engineering. So like I said, when I was at Sony, I found myself more often taking stuff out of Linux than putting stuff in. Uh, and I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, and the interesting thing is, you know how Greg talked about how Linux is getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Well, that means that as Linux get bigger, gets bigger, it's harder to, to build something small with it. If I want to build something this big, as the circle gets bigger and bigger, I have, it's more work. Uh, and so it's network effect in reverse. It's pulling, it's every person that adds code to Linux is, is making it harder for me to build a small system with Linux. Um, and one of the big issues here is that nobody wants to remove stuff that they don't understand. And that's totally understandable uh, from a uh, development perspective. If you've ever done this, I worked many years on systems that allowed people to remove all the print case from the kernel. But we asked our developers, do you want to remove the print case from the kernel? And they said, no, we've got to have the print case. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time doing the projects. The same thing with 4K stacks um, or uh, deferred module initialization. Nobody wants to remove it because it's too much to understand. It's the same thing as with the amount of code, there's the amount of concepts. No one person can understand enough of Linux to feel comfortable pulling it apart. Um, and then, well, and I say, just say no is a subtractive engineering. <laughs> you should not spend a whole bunch of time doing that. And then finally, uh, if we slim down Linux, there comes a point where after you've stripped away all of Linux and you're left with something, it's not really Linux anymore. If you take it down too far, you don't have syscalls, you don't have POSIX. Uh, you don't, you know, if you, if you take away the scheduler and the network stack, you're, you're not running the same thing as anyone else. And so you don't get the network effects. There won't be any books or conferences on the kernel you're running. Uh, if you strip it down so small and make it so custom again. So, so why am I even giving this talk? <laughs> uh, it it kind of raises the question, why do we do this? Why would we want to use Linux in the Internet of Things? What are we trying to reuse? Because really, when you're using Linux, it's about reusing software. You're trying to use software that someone else has written so that you can save your company uh, time and effort. Well, people still want to use the network stack, right, in the Internet of Things. They may want to use the file systems or USB or NFC. And they also definitely want to use the SOC support, right? So someone, what happens these days is that the first operating system that any semiconductor vendor develops on their software is Linux. Okay, so you know 
uh, that Linux is going to be provided, you're going to be able to get that either from your semiconductor vendor or uh, from a Linux vendor. And I want to reuse that. I don't want to have to go off on my own proprietary OS or a custom RTOS and rebuild that. I want that reuse. So how do we do it? What to do? Okay, I wish I had a good answer. <laughs> this is my answer. We fork Linux. <laughs> okay. Now, some of you are going, Tim, you've gone crazy. <laughs> no, you should never fork software. Well, let me talk a little bit about fragmentation. Uh, there's bad fragmentation where what happens is when you split a market up, you divide it into smaller pieces. We all saw this with the Unix wars. Okay? So in the 90s, there were about 13 different flavors of Unix, right? There was Solaris, there was, um, um, oh, what was IBM's? Was uh, AIX uh, and uh, HPUX, several, several different ones. And in the 90s, Unix had the capability of becoming the dominant desktop OS. It had many more features than Windows at the time. But what happened was all these different companies went off and did their own versions of the APIs and the tools, and they ended up fragmenting the market and fragmenting this, particularly the application developers. They didn't understand network effects. And instead of just two circles, notice how those circles at the bottom are smaller. Uh, instead of just two circles, it was 13 really tiny circles. And so when Microsoft came into the market and, and became a kind of a dominant uh, operating system, they couldn't compete because they didn't have enough network effects. Um, and this has had a bad effect that's lasted for years. So uh, the Unix vendors eventually learned that they had to cooperate. And so they came up with things like POSIX, the POSIX standard for Unix APIs, and auto tools. Uh, has anyone here ever run configure? Okay, configure script. So yes, if you've run configure script, though that entire system existed, to try and compensate for this, right? They tried to take it, make it so that you could uh, take the source code and compile it for different Unixes. And uh, it's all painful. And we're still living with it today. It's 20 years later, and we're still running configure scripts and suffering through that pain because of this fragmentation. And that's, this is pretty much the whole reason why people are just hate forks, uh, because that's what happened in the Unix wars. But, there is such a thing as good fragmentation. So, and this has also happened uh, uh, with Linux. Good fragmentation is when uh, instead of dividing a community into different parts, you actually build up a new community that's different. Okay, so, and we saw this with Linux. Um, one of the things that we saw, so you start with a, a new community, you use that to build up a little bit bigger thing, and then somehow, this is the part where magic occurs, you integrate it back into the community. And notice that this circle right here is bigger than this one. You've now got more network effects in the final product, in the final community. And this has happened at least twice in the Linux community. So if you think about UC Linux. So in the early days, Linux did not run on processors that had no uh, memory management unit. So uh, there was a group of developers that wanted to run Linux on the Palm Pilot that, had, that was uh, MMU-less. And so they went off and they did their completely own thing. And it was completely outside the main tree. And I can remember uh, in the uh, late 90s, uh, it, it took Linux where it had never existed before. And the thing about that is because they were off separate, there was no competition. They didn't fragment this community, they just added to it. Well, this, this step here, where, we, where it got reintegrated, that took several years and a lot of hard work. But the end result was that now, today, we can run Linux on something like a Cortex-M3, we can run it on MMU-less systems, uh, because those people forked it. This, the exact same thing happened with Android. So Android went off, started small, and uh, did off, went off and did a bunch of stuff that the mainline community uh, didn't either care about or didn't understand. And now that stuff is being integrated back in, 
And today, we have a much bigger community that consists of both Android developers and Linux developers all working on a common kernel and addressing a lot more, uh, a lot more features. Um, and that's an example of good fragmentation. And you don't have to take my word for it uh, because I've got a Linus quote. <laughs> uh, Linus, way back in 2000, this was a big issue. People asked him about fragmenting. And uh, he said, what made Unix fragmentation so bad was that it was overlapped fragmentation. That the Unixes were all doing the same thing. But that if what you do is you start with something separate and build it up, if you go after a market, you're not subtracting anything from, from Linux. You're actually, in the long run, you're adding to Linux. Uh, and he says the market fragments as opposed to technology, which is good and, and proper. So I think that uh, if you look at embedded and open source, there is this paradox uh, between how do you specialize the software and, and still have that generalization for open source. I think that somewhere down in the intersection of open source and embedded, uh, if we want to go after IoT, if we want to put Linux in that next 9 billion devices, we need to establish kind of a new base camp. We need to fork. Uh, the kernel and the distribution. And uh, if we do that, I think that uh, if we pay attention to the network effects, if we make sure that we build communities that we can reabsorb back into Linux, that we can actually have forking equal growth instead of uh, forking equals pain and, and loss. And uh, anyway, I'll leave, that, uh, leave those ideas with you. And uh, thank you for your time. Any questions, comments, or uh, some um, suggestions or uh, discussion? So there seems to be no person uh, working for <laughs> Internet of Things. <laughs> <laughs> it must be a quite interesting story. session by some guys from Yocto who had done a uh, kernel reduction project <laughs> without forking the kernel, of course. Uh, but, uh, and they actually gave some, there's two presentations uh, from ELC that you should really look at. Uh, one is the micro Yocto uh, presentation, uh, and they're currently able to get a kernel with a text segment size of 753K. Um, and a total system size of about 2 meg. Um, and they went through, in that presentation, they gave a list of the things they did. Um, there's several things you can do from, uh, in terms of reducing the kernel footprint, and it's kind of too long to get in here, but some of them are reducing the size of the network stacks. Uh, network is one of the big areas of the kernel, and they took it from about 400K to about 170K. Um, but, uh, and then there's lots of automated things. The other big thing is something called link time optimization. Uh, and I gave a presentation at last year's LinuxCon where I talked about LTO. Uh, so that's something to pay attention to. The other talk at ELC, uh, and this was even more impressive, uh, was a guy by the name of Vitaly Wool. And, and he has actually got Linux running on a, a ST microcontroller. Uh, and he did it with execute in place. So he took the text portion of the kernel and he put it so that that was running on flash. Uh, and he was able to run the kernel in 256K of RAM, which was uh, very impressive. <laughs> so, so there are people making some very good progress. Uh, anyway, uh, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I that. okay yeah. 
Oh, and you should also check the eLinux Wiki uh, size page. <laughs> yeah, yeah. eLinux e Wiki. You go to eLinux.org. Yeah, yeah. eLinux.org and the, the size page. And some of that, some of those presentations are linked from there. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much, Tim.